I invite you to open up in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is where we'll be today. The title of our message today is An Empty Tomb Full of Meaning. An Empty Tomb Full of Meaning. John chapter 20. But if you'll pause in turning there for just a moment and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your incredible, amazing love for us. Father, we love because you first loved us. And Father, you have displayed that love for us in the most magnificent way and that you have sent your only son to this earth to pay the penalty for our sin, to die upon the cross so that we could have everlasting life. Father, but we also know, Father, that your son did not stay dead. He rose up from the grave, validating what he did on the cross. Uh, Father, showing that he truly is your son, that he truly is God in human form, that he truly has the power to rescue us, that his sacrifice truly was enough uh, to pay the price for our sins. Father, we praise you for Jesus. Uh, Lord, as we spend a few minutes in your word, uh, Father, would you just uh, just help us, Lord, to see your word for, for what it is. Lord, your inspired word breathed out by you that is useful for teaching, for correcting, for rebuking, and for training in righteousness. Father, your, your word that is sharp, like a, like a sword that pierces down into our hearts. Lord, if, we just pray that, Lord, if there be uh, any wayward way in us, Lord, that you would correct us. Lord, if, uh, if, there, if there be any, any sin that's in us, Lord, we pray that you would expose it. Father, uh, we pray that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us from your word. Uh, Father, your word is powerful. And so uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit working your word into us, Lord, would you have your way uh, using your word today uh, to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. We give this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 20. How would you answer this question? What does the resurrection of Jesus mean? What does the resurrection of Jesus mean? The facts are there. An empty tomb, confused guards, an attempted cover-up, the inability to prove that he didn't die, and the inability to prove that he didn't rise and the inability to stamp out the message that he did die and then did rise. Eyewitness testimony of the risen Jesus to the tune of over 500 people. Scores of men and women willing to give their lives to spread the news that Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. The facts are there, but what does it all mean? Does it matter? Does it change who we are and what we do with our lives? Does an event that happened 2,000 years ago really make that much difference in our lives today? Well, I want to help us answer those questions by looking at the account of Jesus' resurrection and some of the events that followed his resurrection as recorded in God's Word by the Apostle John. The resurrection is full of meaning for us today. It's full of meaning for us today, but it doesn't just mean whatever we want it to mean. What does the resurrection of Jesus mean to me is the wrong question. The right question is, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean for me according to God's word? Or we could put it another way. What does God mean for the resurrection to mean for my life? And so to God's word, we are going to turn. I want to share with you from John chapter 20, five things the resurrection means and how we should respond. Five things the resurrection means and how we should respond. Now we're going to, to read and look at and study through uh, all of John chapter 20. We're not going to study it in complete detail, looking at every single verse, though we will read all of John chapter 20, but we're going to read it section by section as we move through this message. And we're going to begin with the first 10 verses. So if you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. This is the Word of God. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, 
and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. The first thing that I want to share with you from, from John chapter 20 is this. The resurrection means God kept his word, and so we should trust him. The resurrection means that God kept his word, so we should trust him. We're told here that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. While, when we study the other gospel accounts, we learn that there were other women that went as well, but it seems that Mary Magdalene, upon seeing the stone moved away, immediately left and ran to tell Simon Peter and John uh, what she had seen. And it seems that she left before the angels appeared to explain the situation. And I want you to notice Mary's assumption. She tells Peter and John, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. She believes that the body of Jesus has been taken, not that he has risen. Now, we know the rest of the story, but just pretend for a moment that you're Mary. Her assumption seems like a reasonable assumption. If someone dies and you watch that person get buried in a tomb, which Mary did according to Mark chapter 15, verse 47, she saw Jesus get placed into the, to the tomb. And then later you go to the tomb and the stone that sealed the entrance to the tomb has been moved and the dead body is missing the most logical, the most common sense conclusion that you would draw from that scenario is that somebody has taken the body. Sometimes my wife and I, we like to give our daughter some, some options. We might say something like, you can either obey mommy and daddy and clean up all your toys and, and then um, we will maybe watch a, a movie or part of a movie before you go to bed. Or you can whine and complain about picking up your toys and still pick up your toys because you're going to have to do that, but then you're not going to get to watch uh, a movie or do something fun like that before you go to bed. Or we might say something like, you can have some ice cream uh, after, your, a, after you eat lunch or you can have some ice cream after you eat supper, but you, you can't have ice cream both times. That, that's not an option. We'll, we'll say, give some options, and we'll say, those right there, those are your only options. And my oldest daughter has picked up on this option thing, and now she thinks that she can turn it around and tell us what her options are. The problem is, for her, it's a problem, that she's five and we're her parents, so she, so she doesn't have the right to make up her own options like eating ice cream both times or whining and complaining and still getting to do something fun like watch a movie. Now, back to Mary Magdalene. In her mind, there's only one option here. Somebody took the body of Jesus. That, that seems like the only option. Somebody must have taken the body of Jesus. From a human standpoint, that really is the only option, the only possible option. But we're not dealing with a mere human here. We are dealing with Jesus, the God-man, we don't just have human options when we look at the empty tomb. We have divine options when we look at the empty tomb. So Peter and John, they run to the tomb along with Mary, and they all see the body is missing, but the grave clothes are still there. John follows Peter into the tomb, and the text says, he saw and believed. Now, I think that that does mean he believed that Jesus had resurrected, but but notice verse 9. It says, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Mary's immediate assumption wasn't that Jesus had risen from the dead, even though that should have been her immediate assumption. And we're not told exactly what Peter is thinking, but he's probably thinking along the same lines as Mary. Though he should have thought Jesus has risen from the dead. And even if verse 8 means that John actually did believe that Jesus had risen, 
he wasn't believing from exactly the right basis because verse 9 says they, referring to all three of them, they did not understand the scripture. If they did, they wouldn't even be shocked by the news that the tomb was empty. They would know and understand exactly what had happened. As soon as they heard that the, the, the stone was rolled away and there was no body, they would have said, well, that's what God's word said would happen. The word scripture here could refer to a specific Hebrew passage such as Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, which says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, that is the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. Maybe another specific verse. Um, or it could be used simply to refer to all of the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament. Either way, God had already prophesied and promised in many places in his word that the Messiah would suffer, would die, and then would rise. The resurrection of Jesus means that God keeps his word. This isn't the only time that we see God keeping his word in scripture, of course, but it is definitely a significant example of God keeping his word. Friends, you can take God at his word. You can trust God and what he says. When God says that he created the world in six days, you can trust that that is exactly what happened. When God says that he will judge the nations with equity, you can trust that that is exactly what will happen. When God says that the righteous will live by faith, you can trust that faith not works is the way to be found righteous in God's sight. When God says submission to his son is the only way to escape his wrath, you can trust that there is no other way. When God says that steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord, you can trust in his unending love. And when God says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, you can trust that he is speaking nothing but the truth. The resurrection means that God keeps his word. And so we should trust him. But now I want us to move to verses 11 through 18. Again, this is God's word. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Baboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Second thing I want you to see here in John chapter 20 is this. The resurrection means Jesus accomplished his work, and so we should rest in him. The resurrection means Jesus accomplished his work. So we should rest in him. Again, there's so much that we could talk about here. But I just want you to notice what Jesus says to Mary in verse 17. He says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Remember. Jesus came to earth for a very specific purpose, which can be seen even in the name that was given to him. The angel appeared to Joseph, who was to be Jesus' earthly father, though not his biological father. And, and speaking of Mary, the angel said, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua, which means he will save from this birth announcement to joseph we see that jesus came on a mission and his mission was to save his people from their sins he came on a mission and being god he would accomplish that mission nothing would deter him nothing would distract him nothing would prevent him from accomplishing the mission of saving his people 
from their sin. And there was only one thing that could save sinful people. Only one thing. And that was a human sacrifice that was also a perfect sacrifice. So a perfect human sacrifice offered to God in place of sinful humans. And so Jesus couldn't go back to heaven. He couldn't ascend back to heaven after a spectacularly miraculous birth. He couldn't go back to his heavenly home after leaving the religious leaders in the temple speechless that a 12-year-old boy could speak so intelligently about the things of God. He couldn't return to his father who sent him after preaching amazing sermons about God's kingdom or after making incredible claims about his identity or after performing incredible miracles. Those things were great, but they didn't accomplish the mission. He couldn't leave earth and go back to heaven until the mission was accomplished, until he, the perfect human, offered his life as a substitute sacrifice, as an acceptable payment to God, a sufficient payment for our sins. And so the resurrection means that he has done what he came to do. The mission is accomplished. Our sin debt has been paid. God's wrath has been satisfied. Death has been defeated. And now he can ascend to his father and sit down at his right hand because his work of salvation is finished. Now we can call his father, our father, as he says here to Mary. We can call him father because Jesus' work of reconciliation is complete. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the resurrected Jesus saying that he is ascending back to the father means that his work of salvation has been accomplished. The only thing there is for us to do concerning salvation is to rest in his finished work he did it we simply rest in it and oh oh, what a rest it is for if we belong to him by his grace through our faith in jesus christ alone if we are trusting in what he accomplished on the cross nothing can snatch us out of his hand we get to rest in him As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The resurrection means Jesus accomplished His work, and so we should rest in Him. But rest in the finished work of Christ is not a call to laziness. There is work to be done. We don't work for our salvation. Jesus did all of that work himself. But we do work because of salvation. God saves us by his grace, not by our work. But he does have work for us to do once he has saved us. And so we turn now to verses 19 through 23. This is God's word. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The third thing that I want you to see that the resurrection means is this. The resurrection means we have been sent on mission. And so we should go. The resurrection means that we have been sent on mission. And so we should go. That same Sunday evening of his resurrection, Jesus had appeared to some of his disciples. Now, there's lots of uh, interesting and important details here. And we, again, we're not going to look at every detail, but I want you to notice Jesus' words to them. He said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so even I am sending you. Jesus doesn't wait around. 
He gets right to the point. His mission on earth is finished. But God's mission through the disciples is just beginning. His mission, Jesus' mission on earth is finished. But God's mission through the followers of Jesus is just beginning. Jesus was sent to this earth to accomplish salvation. Now, the message of salvation had to get to the people so they could hear and believe in the finished work of Jesus. But this mission of getting the message to people was not Jesus' task. It was the task of Jesus' followers. God's mission of raising up people to worship Him from, from every nation, tribe, and tongue includes both Jesus coming to make a way for the nations to worship and believers going to the nations to tell them about this way. Jesus Christ the Lord. God the Father sent God the Son, and He did what He was supposed to do. Now God the Son is sending His followers, and they need to do what they are supposed to do. But it's not just them, it's us as well. It's all of Jesus' followers. Jesus' resurrection means that there is work for us Christians. We are not to sit around with our free salvation twiddling our thumbs. Jesus' resurrection means that there is good news to be told. And it's our mission to tell people this good news. We've been commissioned by Jesus our Lord. But even though Jesus left His followers with a mission, He didn't leave His disciples to accomplish the mission alone. Maybe you're thinking, wow, that's an incredible mission, but I don't think I can do that. I don't think... Even all of us together as believers can do that. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't leave us to do this mission alone. He didn't leave his disciples to accomplish this mission in their own strength and power because that would be impossible. A God-sized mission requires God-sized power to make it happen. A God-sized mission requires God-sized power to make it happen. You don't strap a 50 horsepower motor onto a rocket and expect it to make it to outer space. That's not going to happen. And listen, we can't do what God has called us to do all by ourselves. But God provided the power that was necessary. The first disciples didn't have to accomplish this mission alone, and neither do we. We see here that God the Son has empowered His followers through His Holy Spirit to accomplish the mission. Notice verse 22. It says, And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't actually receive the Holy Spirit in this moment. This was more of a symbolic act of something that was going to come later. Jesus said as much when he told his disciples before he ascended, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It's future tense there. But when that time came, they were then going to be able to look back on this Sunday evening of Jesus' resurrection and remember Jesus breathing on them and say, this power that has come upon us, which has resulted in us living on mission for Jesus, must be the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised us. And that time did come. About seven weeks later, after Jesus breathed on them, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the result was that they told many people the truth about Jesus. They told people that Jesus was the Christ. They told people that Jesus did die. They told people that Jesus did rise from the grave. And they told people that they should believe upon Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2. Knowing that Jesus was alive placed a God-given responsibility upon the disciples to go and tell others this good news as the Holy Spirit empowered them for this mission. And if you know that Jesus died and rose from the grave, and if you have believed in Him, and as a result of believing in Him, have received the power of the Holy Spirit in you, then you have a responsibility to go and tell others. And I do as well. Our master has given us a mission. He did his part in purchasing salvation. Now, church, it's time for us to do our part in proclaiming salvation. It's time to go. 
It's time to go to our family, to go to our friends, to go to our neighbors, to go to our community, to go to our world. The resurrection means that we have been sent on mission, and so we should go. But as we go with the message, message of Jesus, what is, what is the exact response we are calling people to have? I mean, what, what do we want people to do with this message that Jesus has died and is now alive? It's the same thing that as Christians, you and I have done with this message. It is to believe. To believe in Him. And this leads us to verse 24. You'll follow along beginning now in verse 24. This is God's Word. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now I know we didn't finish verse 31, but we'll finish it in just a moment. The fourth thing I want you to see here about the meaning of the resurrection is this. The resurrection means that we are faced with a choice. And so we should believe. The resurrection means that we are faced with a choice. And so we should believe. Thomas was not with the disciples the evening of the resurrection, this passage tells us. And they told him, but he refused to believe until he had seen Jesus with his own eyes. Now, to be fair, it's possible that none of the other disciples except for John, as indicated in verse 8, believed till they saw Jesus either. So we don't want to just pick on Thomas. But now it's Thomas's turn. About a week later, Jesus appeared to his disciples again, and this time the passage tells that Thomas was with them. And Jesus told Thomas to touch his wounds. And then he said to Thomas, Do not disbelieve, but believe. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And what did Thomas choose? He chose to believe. He chose to believe. But Jesus knew that he, Jesus, wouldn't be visibly appearing to everyone. And yet that in no way was a reason for people to not believe. For Jesus said here to Thomas and the rest of the disciples who were there, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus is saying that the lack of his physical presence is no excuse for refusing to believe. Just like Peter and John and Mary should have known from God's word that an empty tomb meant Jesus was alive, we should choose to believe based on the testimony from God's word, even though we can't see Jesus with our eyes. Notice here the repetition of the word believe. Starting at the end of verse 25, we see these words of Thomas, I will never believe. And then skip to verse 27. Jesus says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And then verses 29 through 31, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The repetition of the word believe here, along with John's purpose statement in verse 31, points to an extremely important point. Don't miss this. The resurrection of Jesus forces us to make a choice. Regardless of whether or not we have seen Jesus with our eyes, we have a choice to make. Will we believe in Jesus? Or will we not? Belief or rejection, those are the options. 
Remember our talk earlier about options? Like my daughter who says, oh, I have another option. We like to come up with a third option here. We say, well, I'll sort of believe in Jesus, but I'm not going to really change who I am. Well, I'm, I'm glad Jesus came, but I'm just going to keep him at a distance until I need him. Or maybe we say, I'm not rejecting him. I'm just putting him on the shelf for now until I've lived my way for a little while, had my fun. Then when I've done what I want to do, I'll pull him off the shelf and and make him a more important part of my life. We say, I'm going to believe in Jesus, but I'm going to work to earn God's love and make sure that God will accept me. We say, well, sure, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was a real person, but I'm not giving up my dreams and my plans to follow him. Friends, those are not third options. There is no third option. Those are all just different ways of rejecting Jesus. Either you believe in Jesus or you disbelieve, which is to reject. There is no middle road. You either walk into the embrace of Jesus, trusting God's word, resting in Jesus' finished work, and submitting to the mission to go to the lost and faithful service to Jesus your King, or you walk away and reject Him and the salvation that He provides. It's all or nothing. Either Jesus has all of you or He has none of you. Either you believe in Him or you reject Him. The resurrection of Jesus means that we are faced with a choice. And we should believe. But maybe you're asking, What's the benefit of believing in Jesus? Why should I? What's the benefit? Well, if you're asking that, I'm glad you've asked. Because that leads us to the final meaning of Jesus' resurrection that I want to share with you today. Notice with me the last part of verse 31. And that by believing, you may have life in His name. And that by believing, you may have life in His name. The fifth fifth thing that I want you to see here about the meaning of the resurrection is this. The resurrection means believers are promised life. And so we should celebrate. The resurrection means that believers are promised life. And so we should celebrate. Why should you believe? Because it's the only way to have life. Now, Now, maybe you're thinking, I have life. I'm breathing right now. I'm alert. My heart is beating. Well, that's true. But if you haven't believed in Jesus for salvation, then the life you have is limited. Not only by your heart's ability to keep beating, but also by the chains of sin with which you are bound. The life you have is like like that of a prisoner. It is life that lacks the joy of being free. It is life that is lived under the weight and condemnation of sin. It's not real life. It's not abundant life. It's not eternal life. But here is the good news. Jesus came to give you real life. Jesus came to break the chains of sin and set you free from its weight and condemnation. Jesus came to give you life that is full of joy no matter the circumstances because you know that you belong to Him and nothing can change that. Jesus came to give you life that has purpose as you live for His mission, making a difference in the lives of others that will last for all of eternity. Jesus came to give you life that is everlasting life that extends beyond the grave. Jesus came to give you life, as this passage says, in His name. Which means if your life is tied up in His life, and if His life continues because He has conquered the grave, which He has, then your life will continue beyond the grave as well. Friends, that is real life. This is why you should believe that by believing, you may have life in His name. If you have believed in Jesus, and you know what it's like to experience new life in Christ, then you should celebrate Jesus' resurrection is a cause for celebration for all who believe in Him. Pandemic or no pandemic, it's time to celebrate. And not just today, but listen, every day of our lives, in the highs and lows of life, on the fun days and on the hard days, the resurrection of Jesus turns our fleshly desire to gripe and complain into a God-given desire to celebrate 
no matter what comes our way. We have joy. We have hope. We have freedom from sin. We have eternal life with Jesus. Christian, we have reason to celebrate today and every day as we wait on that coming day when we will celebrate together around the throne of Jesus, worshiping the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain, the One who alone is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. But this promise of life is only for those who have believed. This celebration is only for those who have believed. And so I ask you, have you believed in Jesus? Are you trusting God and His Word? Are you resting in the finished work of Christ on the cross? Are you submitting to Jesus as your King, going on mission every day for Him? Are you believing today in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? If not, then what are you waiting for? Don't miss the celebration. You and I, we are not promised tomorrow. To walk away, to not believe in Him, is to reject Him. Confess your sin to God today. Ask God to save you because of what Jesus did on the cross. Submit your life to the Lordship of Christ. Choose to believe in Jesus right now. And then celebrate By telling someone about the new life that you have in Christ. Jesus is alive. His resurrection is packed with meaning. It was full of meaning the day He rose from the grave. It is full of meaning today. And it will be full of meaning for all of eternity. The resurrection does matter. The resurrection does change who we are and how we live our lives. The resurrection is an event that happened 2,000 years ago that really does make a difference, a world of difference, an eternal difference in our lives today. Church, the tomb is empty, but it is full of meaning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Thank you that He rose up from the grave. Thank you that He, having authority to lay His life down and authority to bring it back up again, that He did just that. That He laid it down for us and He brought it back to life, conquering the grave so that all who have believed in Him, who are resting in His finished work on the cross, Because they are trusting in Your Word that says that You will save all who believe in Jesus for salvation. Father, when we join Jesus on His mission, Father, we thank You for this salvation that comes from You. Father, we praise You. We worship You that Jesus laid His life down and took it back up. And we celebrate the new life that we have in Christ. We celebrate today an empty tomb. We celebrate every day an empty tomb that is full of meaning. Not whatever we want it to mean, but what you have told us in your word it means for each of us. Father, thank you. All praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb who was slain. Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior. It is in His precious name we pray. Amen.